Challenge. Can you post another Q&A within six months? No, I cannot. What are your favorite and least favorite kinds of questions to answer? A long time ago in a state far away, I did an event with some friends where my job was to pick questions from the audience. Right before the show started, Pretty Derek turned to me and said, Please don't pick superlatives. And I said, What's a superlative? Best, worst, favorite, least favorite. Ah. The show begins, and those were probably half the questions in the bowl. But Derek, having had much more experience with Q&As, was totally right. On the spot, those questions are pretty hard to answer. But also, as I've grown up, I found the whole concept of a favorite X has become more abstract and situational. Favorite things seem to be more important the younger you are, which makes sense, because you don't really know who you are, and so define yourself by the world around you. And it's also practice for the tribal affiliation games we never escape, even as adults. Which can make trying to answer these questions super unfun when people take the answer way too seriously. Is art entirely subjective? How is it then that some art can widely be considered better? And how come we're able to think that ourselves or others can get better at art? If we give awards and teach classes on art, then there must be some kind of criteria for good art. What defines good art? How can art connect with so many people and yet still be personal? Let's say, for instance, that you prefer chocolate ice cream, but there's more to consider. Is it top shelf or generic? Maybe you'd rather opt for a luxury vanilla over a dime store chocolate, or maybe your preference overrides the difference. But even if you were the biggest chocoholic in the world, you'd probably still refuse a melted cone that's covered in ants. That's because there's flavor, but there's also quality. Here's two phrases with distinctly different implications. I like this movie, and this is a good movie. While casual conversation might use these terms interchangeably, the former implies relative subjectivity, while the latter implies universal objectivity. For example, I can't argue that you didn't like a movie. It'd be like arguing that no, you do not in fact actually like chocolate ice cream. One could argue that you're lying about liking it, but one can always argue that you're lying about anything, so that point is moot. You liked the movie, and you proved it by saying it. That's what you'd call flavor. But is it a good movie? Unlike the previous declaration, which is self-proving, this one can be argued against. Like ice cream, one can argue that it wasn't well made, or that it's covered in ants. Different critics are going to use different metrics to answer if something's good, so a good critic will explain clearly how they're determining something's goodness, and won't just say, I liked it, so it's good. In fact, it's possible to admit that a movie is good even if it doesn't meet your personal preferences. You can acknowledge that it was well made despite it not being your favorite flavor. That's what you'd call quality. Art, then, is the blending of the relative and the universal. I believe that the best art is selfish, and therefore a good artist is someone who makes the kinds of things that they themselves want to see in the world. This drive to create is what pushes people to improve and refine their craft. And ultimately, eventually, your personal vision will relate to other people, because they'll see that dedication and skill permeating your work. What was once relative only to you through effective execution can become something universal. Prowess based on preference is what creates art. Flavor and quality. Like art, critique is rooted in a certain degree of relatability. The point of a review is for others to be able to understand it. An explanation is an art form all its own. You can't just say, I liked it because I liked it. The best reviews are entirely subjective. But that doesn't mean you throw objectivity out the window. You have to build your case with honest statements that even someone who disagrees with you could relate to. In my own approach to critique, I try to focus on clear concepts that I can communicate to an audience without getting bogged down by personal taste. I won't praise something for doing something, I'll praise it for doing it well. I also don't make a habit of deciding favorites. It's partially on purpose, but it also doesn't come naturally to me. I don't even have a favorite color or favorite food. Selecting favorites has always felt arbitrary to me. On any given day, I'm liable to change my answer, so why have an answer? But I do have a favorite TV show.